My name is Selena Justice. I'm the strategy lead at Pivotal Ventures, which is um, an incubation and investment company founded by Melinda French Gates. And, um, and we aim to bring more opportunity and equality to people in the US. Our specific focus is on centering women of girls and color um, in an interject intersectional and intergenerational effort to advance equitable social progress by affirming and centering the power of women and girls of color in the United States. I am honored that that work has brought me here to this stage with you all, brilliant partners who are fighting to center the needs and voices of women and girls of color every single day. Um, and in particular today, we're gonna be focusing on the need to center girls and gender expansive youth of color in our work. So I have with me um, Lizette Orellana Engel from Justice and Joy National Collaborative, <laughs> formerly National Crittenton on the end here. Um, Justice and Joy is a national advocacy org with goals to achieve collective power to advance justice, establish affirming social narratives, and build economic systems of support with and for her and them. Um, anybody that was at the speaker's briefing on Monday saw the president of Justice and Joy, Jeanette Piespinoso. Um, then I have um, Joanne Smith and Pony White with Girls for Gender Equity. Girls for Gender Equity, right here, Girls for Gender Equity works intergenerationally through a black feminist lens to center the leadership of black girls and gender expansive youth and people of color in reshaping culture and policy through advocacy, youth-centered programming, and narrative shift to achieve gender and racial justice. Um, Pony White is a West African Liberian refugee, reproductive justice advocate, and a storyteller, and is one of the young advocates working with GGE. And Joanne Smith is the founding president and CEO. Um, for anyone that, that was at the plenary session yesterday with Tarana and Maheen, um, Joanne's name was called out multiple times, was, pulled, was lifted up multiple times. Um, she's been in this, this fight for a long time, as has Dr. Monique Kuvsen, um, right here with me, with Grantmakers for Girls of Color, the primary national philanthropic intermediate organization with an explicit focus on girls, femmes, and gender expansive youth of color in the US and territories. <laughs> Again, I'm so, so honored to be sitting up here with you all. Um, I, I wanna just start off with just a, a little bit about what Pivotal Ventures does, um, which is that we have identified three areas to focus on that will have um, some really great impact. One being expanding women and girls of color's influence and control over capital to build intergenerational wealth. Two, amplifying women and girls of color's agency and support as they rise and build power and influence. And three, building a strong foundation of confidence, agency, and joy in girls of color. So I wanna focus on that third goal right now. What does building a strong foundation of confidence, agency, and joy in girls of color mean to each of you in the work that you do? And, um, and, and also, what are gender and reproductive and racial justice movements missing by not centering girls and gender expansive youth in their work? Um, I would say that um, what the goal is, I think, is true liberation um, and for young girls and gender expansive youth of color to be thriving. Um, and what that looks like, it's, it's personal, right? It's, it's not just them thriving in maybe, you know, workspaces or academic spaces, but also in their personal lives. Um, and I think that's the importance of reproductive justice is because it is encompassing all of that. It is um, going further outside of just thinking about, you know, who has access to abortions or not, right? It's, it's thinking about like the bigger picture. And I think what that will look like is when we do have young people entirely thriving in all areas and all sectors of their life, having autonomy and choice um, and being able to make decisions that benefit them and their families and communities. Um, and what we're lacking, um, I mean, we, we continue to see it. Um, 
we've all been doing, well, not we all, I've <laughs> been doing this work for like six years, um, but many of you have been doing this work for a very long time. And sometimes when I'm in spaces and I get to hear from you all, those that I consider elders, some of the issues that I'm hearing is that it's almost like we're going backwards, right? Like when we think about Roe v. Wade, it's like this, this feeling of like, we're missing something, we went backwards, something wasn't there. And I think what wasn't there is intersectionality. I think what wasn't there was genuine inclusion. Um, when we say we all do better when we all do better, I think we have to say we all do better when our most marginalized do better, right? So when we're not including black women, black youth, black girls, black trans girls, right? When we're not including all of these identities and demographics, we're not doing the work that we truly are setting out to do, right? Because we're, we're leaving holes in our boat. Um, and so I think that's the issue. That's, that's the bigger problem that we continue to see where laws are being you know, passed against our own will and wants. Um, and we're seeing issues and we're seeing young people continue to die and we're not seeing the movement go in places that we want it to. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Pony. Lizette, what do you think? What does building a strong foundation of confidence, agency, and joy in, in girls of color mean to you? Um, I would actually like to answer that from the point of view of young people. I so appreciate Pony's um, message and what she said, because what I want to say is what I hear from young people is the fact that the inclusivity and partnership are so important to success. Um, it's understanding the intersectionality of issues. Um, I think as adults, we always feel like we know best, and sometimes we might think that because we have been around a little longer, but not necessarily because it's true. Um, you miss out on leadership, on innovation, on this incredible hunger and eagerness to learn and to partner up. Um, I had the opportunity to come into this work as a young person when I was 21, um, when a lot of people wouldn't necessarily open doors or talk to me or even listen to me as a young mom. But now I'm here, and to be able to work with young people and to be able to learn from them continuously is probably the best gift. Um, understanding that they're the ones calling us out on the gaps, right? Like, where are the folks who have disabilities? Where are the folks who have the children? Who, where are the system-impacted folks? Um, and ensuring that we are getting called out on what we're missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll piggyback off of Lisette. Um, first, it's an honor to be here. I think um, even beyond the day, like it's an honor to be here, right? To be alive, to be present, um, and to be working intergenerationally. Similarly to Lisette, started this work very young, early 20s, started GGE at a time when I would lie about my age. <laughs> Just lie. Um, because I <laughs> wanted to be taken seriously, wanted to be seen as, you know, knowing more, and, you know, you, you were always told to fake it till you, till you make it. And we know, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily work. That builds anxiety, y'all. And finally, you know, in this generation of young people, um, we're able to hear truths and we're able to work and, and actually heal in truths um, that often are seated by young people calling us out in, right? Um, we're able to get some of the best strategies, but bigger than the strategy that you can take and then get funded, the reality around the implementation and the process and the years that you know it takes um, to have systemic change and movement building. Um, you get then that intergenerational power, that intergenerational brain trust um, that is gonna move the work far beyond where we are in our stage of life. And so we get movement building collectively. And it's, it's a practice that um, many of us indigenously are called to. I'm first generation Haitian and you know, I grew up, children are you know, seen and not heard, right? Um, but the reality of what it took for the whole family to run the household, right? Um, the re reality of what it took for um, caregiving to happen within the household, what it took for us to even economically you know, have a thriving household. Um, it took the children. I, I know my sister was working at 13, right? And so um, you get also truth telling, um, you get the best practice when we go back to these indigenous, indigenous ways of working and being that honors the intergenerational being. It also means we don't dispose of people. So when you become elder, right, you have built then um, that belief and that gone back to that system of we're gonna honor every stage of life, but you have to start with the 
beginning of life. And so that's some of, some of what you get. Yeah, I appreciate that concept of elevating this notion of co-construction and collective work, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. deeply important. Um, and like others have shared, you know, I started in my work at a very young age too. Um, started working as a domestic worker actually when I was 12 mm -hmm. and then went on to start teaching at 15. So have been in a lot of different spaces in this work. Uh, and I think that what that has taught me is that you cannot build foundations on toxic soil. Um, and that when you do, there is decay in the building. Mm -hmm. And so the work that needs to be done to ensure that we're engaging girls, femmes, and gender expansive youth of color in this work is to ultimately maintain the quality of the soil mm -hmm. and to work on ourselves in a way that provides that foundation that is solid and consistent and that engages them even in what that soil should feel like, what it should be for them, and that when we don't have that, what we miss is the fire, right? Mm -hmm. We miss the ability for us to understand the nuances and the complexities and the dynamic way in which these uh, young people are experiencing life and the way that we can then be in partnership with them. Uh, and to improve not just those, to your point, like those who have been marginalized and when we work there and build backwards, we know everybody's covered, but to ensure that when they are covered, that we elevate the entire community's whole perspective about what is possible. Mm -hmm. What girls, femmes, and gender expansive youth give, for, uh, give to us is this incredible gift of understanding possibility. Mm -hmm. Expands our notion of justice and challenges us to think how we can then be better in our lived experiences with them, but also in the structures we build for them. That's right. Thank you, beautiful. And you know, I'm so impressed by all of the work that you do because um, each of your organizations is so intentionally intergenerational, not just, not just in who you serve, but who is on your staff, who, who works in the organization. Um, and so um, I wanna highlight a little bit of, um, of the, the really good work that, that you all do, um, in, particularly, in particular the policy and advocacy work that Girls for Gender um, Girls for Gender Equity does and Justice and Joy National Collaborative do. Um, there's the work that, um, that Justice um, and Joy has led to support systems impacted youth and young mothers at the federal level. And they've done this um, through working with over 500 young people across the nation. Um, and, um, and then GGE has spearheaded the National Agenda for Black Girls and Girls Bill of Rights, which I'd love for you to talk more about, Joanne and, um, and Pony. And, and as you can see, this, this work spans not just gender justice, but reproductive justice and racial justice. Um, and so I'd like, I'd like to hear a little bit from each of you about um, uh, about examples of how your organizations are building programs that go beyond one silo um, and incorporate intersectionality across across all of this work. Um, Lizette, can I go to you first? Sure, thank you. That's such a great question. And I love the fact that we're all here because we're partners in the work and the work that we're doing is, tr is a true representation of intersectionality and it really portrays and paints a picture of what's really going on with young people. All our young people are partners as we are partners. And so it's really great that we can all talk and address the same um, topics. And so at Justice and Joy, over the past three years, we have been incredibly intentional about providing space and hosting space when nobody else would for girls and gender expansive young people of color, especially those who are system impacted in the juvenile justice system and foster care young moms, folks with disabilities, folks who are otherwise unseen. Um, over the past three years, we held conversations um, from well over 35 states and 10 tribal nations to hear directly from them about what it was that we needed to do to push at the policy level. Our young moms have, are developing a policy agenda to address the inequities in childcare, housing, economic justice. But it's not just young moms, it's young moms who have been in foster care, who have been juvenile 
just as impacted and involved and they're really bringing those issues to the forefront because just like we know we don't lead single issue lives and when policymakers ask us well there is a policy that isn't working they're not going to tell you which law is not working they're going to tell you the issues aren't working policy versus practice um, working with system impacted youth we've had great conversations at the federal level with the children's bureau and ojjdp uh, discussing some of the um, things that the states are just not doing well they're not listening to young moms. They're not responding to the reproductive justice crisis now. And th that's a conversation that I know we'll address very soon. But in spaces where we're talking about women um, and reproductive justice issues, young people are just not present. And their, their challenges are just amplified uh, by what's happening right now. We have been very present in pushing legislation around Families First Act. Rise from Trauma Act and Push Out, which we've been partners on to ensure that we're not just talking about one thing. It's education, it's housing, it's economic justice, it's young moms. So we are trying to listen to young people and letting them know they're, they don't exist in just one space. We shouldn't work in silos. We're in this together. Yeah. And, and <laughs> similarly, um, you know, our work has, one of the things we pride ourselves in is, is being able to hear and listen um, and follow and at the same time um, hold accountable what we said we would do, right? Um, to do what we said we would do. And so our work, especially around policy and advocacy, started with Title IX organizing, um, which then very quickly led into organizing around sexual harassment, sexual violence, especially in schools. And I'm talking about elementary schools, middle schools, right? I'm not talking about college, um, high schools. Um, young people just, you know, speaking of their experiences walking to our office, but also their experiences in schools and zero tolerance policies and the way in which they were impacted by them and them getting suspended for retaliation because they're being sexually harassed and they're telling somebody to stop, they're pushing them away from them, they're taking their hands off their body. And so um, really then addressing school push out, um, linking with uh, Dr. <laughs> Moni. I, used, I used to be Morris and, and now I'm cursing. It's about to come out. Adjusting. <laughs> and I was like, I'd rather swallow it. <laughs> Dr. Koopson. <laughs> Koopson. Um, in, in 2011, right? Um, yeah, through Nakisha Lewis, um, uh, who was able to see, you know, and connect the work and, and young people being able to share um, their experiences at a conference, their participatory action research, and then um, collectively come together around the research that Dr. Kusin was doing. But then um, move into um, ending the criminalization of girls, ending the criminalization in schools, of course, on the streets. Um, always a through line of gender-based violence, um, then collectively working with the National, uh, the New York Women's Foundation and cross-sector with women's funds um, to form the first ever Young Women's Initiative nationally and working with the Speaker's Office in New York City, so governmental agency, philanthropic agency, um, organizations, young people. Um, and you know, through that work, lifting up then recommendations that girls of color, trans youth, gender non-conforming youth had, in, especially in New York City, um, around multiple areas and ways in which our practice policy resource allocation um, could better serve their lives and humanity. Um, and then realizing even through that work that uh, black girls really needed that centering and that space and um, to be heard. Um, to be seen and to activate. And so we formed the National Agenda for Black Girls, which really was a political home of civic engagement and building the political power of young people. And they had their national agendas, and um, it was at a time when our uh, 2019 presidential election, um, they interviewed Biden staff, they, inter they, they offered to interview all the candidates. Um, and then of course quarantine hit and the needs and reality of what was happening in homes of black girls and, and their needs shifted. And so again, we listened. And so now in this iteration of listening, um, really turned to young people and said, what is it that you need? So Pony, what is it that y'all did when we said that? 
Yeah, so thank you so much, Joanne. So what we did to answer Joanne's question, um, we at Girls for Gender Equity, I and a team of amazing young black um, advocates, um, we put together um, a 15 point plan and a memo. Um, and so within this memo, the it's right there, <laughs> we remember um, black girls for reproductive, um, black youth for reproductive freedom, I should say. Um, we put this memo together and it, it explains a lot of different um, issues and areas that we want policymakers, we want system leaders, we want you all to kind of focus in on when we're talking about reproductive justice. We talk about access, right? We talk about, you know, removing policing from in our communities and from in our schools. Um, we talk about empowering our communities. Um, so it's a really wonderful memo that I encourage all of you um, to read. Um, one of my favorite aspects of the memo is that it is written the way that the writers wrote it. And when I say that, I mean, we were a group of black folks and if we, the way we talk is the way we wrote. And I love that when it went through the editing process, the team at GGE kept it just like that. So like, when you go through it. <laughs> Thank you. So when you go through it, like, there, there's not, you know, like, if, you, if you're like, wait, what is it, what's this? No, 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 read it again. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but we, we put together the 15 point plan and I'll just read a little bit. Um, number one, ensure true access to safe, culturally affirming, mental, physical, and reproductive health care for all sexes, genders, ages, and classes. Number two, end all criminalization of reproductive choices for all birthing people and for medical providers. Number three, provide mandatory evidence-based training about culturally include, Conscious, sorry, conscious, affirming, and inclusive care for medical professionals, especially regarding patients across the gender spectrum. So we really did this, and this was a really exciting project to put together, and the team that came together to do it was all asked, would you guys be interested in this? And we were like, yes. And so talking about that, talking about youth engagement, I love GGE. Um, if I could be a spokesperson for GGE for the rest of my life, I would. Um, <laughs> they're not forcing me to say this. <laughs> Um, but I say that because recently um, in another, so I, I run, a, I do like five billion things, um, but recently in another space, um, I do comms work for this org and the CEO was like, how do we get young people to like engage with us? Like we got to post on TikTok, we got to da 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 da. And I was like, they ain't going to look at that. <laughs> I was like, we don't care, but let me tell you, I've been working with orgs as the young person, as the young advocate, as the young whatever, for a while, and I'll tell you something, a lot of their social medias, I don't care. I, I'm not there, it's, that's cool, but that's not what I'm interested in looking at, that's not what I'm interested in, and that's not why I'm with them. Some of the best orgs, and GGE, in my opinion, is one of the best, it's, it's number one on my list. Um, it's a blueprint, I'm gonna tell y'all, let me lay it down for y'all. Um, but one of the best things about GGE is that, like when we said earlier, like, they cater to the entirety of a young person. It's not just like this gimmick, it's not this like, oh yeah, we know we should say young people matter too, cause yeah, you know, eventually. No, it's, it's genuine, it's this genuine like, we want you in these spaces, they empower young people, um, they give young people the tools to lead, and they also like help young people find their direction. And so I told the, the CEO when I was talking to her, I was like, that's what you should do. I'm like, if you're really invest, if you're really interested in how can we get young people on board, do programs like that. Do programs where the young people across New York City, because this is specific to New York, the young people across New York City feel affirmed because they got a lot to say and they know a lot that's going on in their communities and they know the issues and they know the struggles to be academically present and they know the struggles in their households and the financial issues, they know it but not many people, especially adults, treat them as if they know what's going on. And that's the problem. So when we're, when we're doing all of this work and like how do we engage young people, treat them like people, like show them. We can't say, oh, we want autonomy for them, we want this for them, but then you're still treating them as if they're like puppets, right? Like really affirm them, affirm them in their choices. And one thing I loved about GGE was I came from Minnesota. Like <laughs> I was a part of another initiative that GGE was like partnering with or something. And they're like, you wanna apply for the National Agenda for Black Girls? I was like, yeah. <laughs> Cause I never say no to anything. Um, and I joined and I was like, ah, it's gonna be another, you know, another cool little thing on my little college resume. Like we gonna keep it pushing. Um, but I'm going to these meetings and it's a space where folks are literally like, Okay, we talk, we spend 20 minutes teaching y'all some policy stuff, because education is important. Teach young people, because we need to know what we need to know. But it's like, we spent 20 minutes now, what's up? How'd you guys feel about it? What do you guys think about it? How does it apply to your community? 
like genuine space for us to then sit and talk. And I'm hearing from people in other states, in Texas, in Atlanta, and you know, everywhere, like folks talking about their experiences. And I was, I joined GG at a time when we're having George Floyd, and then when we turned around and had Dante Wright, and I'm a Minnesota advocate. So I'm coming to a space where, I'm in a state where I can't connect with the black folks because I can't really talk to my black friends. We're all in the same headspace. We're all struggling the same thing. So I get to be in a space where I'm just like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. And I was held and I felt it. And then when Dante Wright happened and I was arrested and I was like, I don't have money for a lawyer. Didn't even ask them, just venting. Yeah, like, I'm stressed, I don't have money for a lawyer. They were like, we'll pay for it. And I was like, I remember telling my mom, like, I <laughs> the what? Like, I just started working with this org. They're like, we'll take care of it because that's community. So it was, it was more than just like, oh yeah, you're gonna talk about this, you're gonna organize, that's great. It was caring about the individual. So that's my advice, it's like bringing young people in so we can create amazing things like this. This 15 point plan, I want everybody to take it and I want system leaders to incorporate it and really hear our voices through it. But in order for us to have gotten there, they had to nurture us as individuals. So yeah. Thank you, Pony. Thank you. Where can everybody in this room find that 15 point plan? Yes, so you can go to our Instagram, so Girls for Gender Equity, GGE, and when you click into our link tree, if you scroll, I think it might be like the fourth one, it says read the We Remember um, Black Youth for Reproductive Freedom memo. So yeah, that's where you can find it. Thank you. Um, I didn't even know that. Oh. There you go. Like, <laughs> Thank God Pony's here, Joanne. <laughs> Google it. Like, I <laughs> okay, I want to switch us over to talking um, for a minute about narratives. Um, yeah, it's this is this is a piece of um, of the work that's so important. Um, Dr. Kubson, you're an expert in this. We're everybody up here is experts in this, but um, but with your amazing book, Push Out, I'm really an expert in in this work and the and and um, the funding that you do um, through Grantmakers for Girls of Color. Um, you know, there has been some places I think in the last couple of years um, where um, where matters that um, that. that the issues that matter deeply for women have, have gotten an uptick in coverage, um, caregiving, for example, and yet over and over again, who's missing in those conversation? Girls, especially black, black and brown girls who you know, in the caregiving space are disproportionately serving as caregiving caregivers within their households and yet are not mentioned. The same goes for policy and advocacy um, in the wake of the Dobbs decision. Um, just in general, the millions of young people who've been stripped of their bodily autonomy um, are, not, are not being talked about, are not being lifted up. And then I would say that on the flip side, um, in, in mental health, this is a space where we have begun to see young people being lifted up um, in these discussions, particularly as we grapple with the ramifications of isolation and loneliness that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. But but so often it's black and brown and indigenous girls that are, that are left out of that um, conversation. So, so, so often it's, it's white girls that are represented as, as the symbols of that. Um, and so um, I know Joanne, Monique, both of you guys do work in the narrative space as well. Um, when we, think, when we think about that work, how do we make sure that, that girls, um, young women, and gender expansive young people are included in the national narrative, whether it be in reproductive justice or, um, or economic justice? Um, how do we make sure that they are included, that they're centered? And again, what are we missing when they are not included? Um, okay, I'll, I'll start. I, I, I appreciate your kind words about push out. Um, there were actually a lot of lessons learned from the work that um, I led in that space. For those of you who don't know, I'm the author of Push Out, The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools. That was also uh, the inspiration for a documentary film of the same name that featured Miss Joanne Smith and some <laughs> others that are here and, and key partners with me in this work, um, Jeanette Pai Espinosa and others. And so, you know, as I think about um, you know, this question of narrative, it's really, you know, narrative is about the stories we tell. We tell stories in a lot of different ways. So one of the things that I have tried to do 
um, in my own personal scholarship and work, as well as the work that we are resourcing through Grantmakers for Girls of Color, is to elevate all the ways that we can tell a story all the ways that we come to know and understand. The beautiful thing about women is that we have multiple ways of knowing, and we activate those multiple ways of knowing all the time. And so it is important for us to build out content, to Pony's point, that speaks to young people, but also that speaks to the adults who are gonna be in partnership with young people in ways that tap into these ways of knowing. So the, you know, the interesting thing about, you know, our work is we operate inherently through an intersectional frame. And a lot of people throw out this term intersectionality and think they understand it, but I always try to define it in every space that I'm in to make sure we're all operating with the same definition. And intersectionality is a framework to help us understand that people are operating and living with multiple identities, and it's at the intersection of these multiple identities that we come to understand their relationships with systems, organizations, institutions, and other people. So it's not just the naming of multiple identities entities that we're living with that constitutes intersectionality. It's about understanding how those impact their experiences, their lived experiences and interactions with systems and inter in, in institutions and people, et cetera. And so knowing that, mm -hmm. as we create uh, opportunities to storytell, as we create spaces for the distribution of information that gets us to understand more deeply a particular issue or lived experience, then it is important for those narratives to reflect the lived experiences and voices of those who are impacted by a particular condition. I will say, you know, even on the concept and, and, and in discussions about reproductive justice, almost none of our grantee partners, we have moved about $25 million to about 400 grantee partners wow. nationwide, in DC, funding in DC, Guam, and Puerto Rico as well. And almost none of them were able to place an op-ed on this question of reproductive justice. Yeah. Okay? So when we're thinking about who is telling the story, people want to talk about our folks, but they never really want to hear from our folks. And that's something that has to shift. And it's something that I believe shifts when we start to create the thing that doesn't exist. So our... Um, priorities in funding around narrative have really been about amplifying the voices and, and funding re and resourcing um, organizations to tell their own stories, develop their own platforms for this distribution. We have produced uh, documentary films that help move some of this work along so that we can uh, challenge some of those narratives. But I also think it's the responsibility of those of us in this room, when we say we're funding narratives, to ask the questions, right? To ask those that we're funding, are you also including the voices of those who are impacted by these conditions, right? Are we leveraging our power in such a way that invites them, to, if they haven't thought about it, to think about it? And if they have thought about it and decided not to do it, to rethink their position. And so it is important, I think, for all of us to recognize that the voice of young people is a critical voice. How they say what they say is important. Um, you know, the uh, sidebar is the, the first book I ever wrote was a graphic, it was a uh, street novel. And it was written in the voice of the people that I was writing about, okay? So it was a book about pimping <laughs> in the Bay Area. And I wrote it in the voice of a pimp, in the voice of a woman who was participating in sex work, a girl, right, their child. And it was important for me to maintain the authenticity of those voices in that creative space. And I believe that it's important for us to maintain the creativity that we apply in some of our other literature to the work that we are doing here today. Because the point is for people to understand and engage you, which is again why I started by saying there are many ways to tell a story. We use data, we use narrative, uh, qualitative data, we use N numerical data, quantitative data. We we tell stories and we sit in circles. We 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 sit on panels, right? Like there are, there are lots of ways for us to talk about it, but we've got to commit to talking about it, and we have to commit to talking about it with those who are impacted by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll I'll jump. Go ahead, y'all. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, done. Okay. I'll jump in on that too because I think the piece that I love that you said and, and Pony mentioned and you said it without saying it, you've come into, it's a coming of age also, a narrative and culture shift, right? And so you get the space to actually not have the gaze of an audience, right? You actually get the space that how you shift culture, you get, you give, offer, 
and understand that you are not the center of that space, that you have offered young people of color to find their voice, understand why, or reckon with, um, go back and forth and debate around, um, you know, come to a conclusion about, change their mind. Right? Allowing them to also deliberate in that space, educate each other in that space, and again, without the gaze. So an understanding that you know the voice can't be commodified. We can't just value voice when we can get something from it. It's not a transactional you know, culture shift. It's a culture shift, a narrative shift, that allows for all of us to thrive and live our best lives. And that honoring of the space that spaces that you can't see and won't enter and can't enter and shouldn't ask to enter um, should also be supported and funded and honored in the same way. So it means once you, you know, give a grant for those groups to happen, you're not asking for a, a, a 10, a 15 point agenda afterwards, right? It's not proved to me. It's been proven. They took the space to share and shift narrative. And now they are leaving that space and moving forward with a narrative that they can bring into the world that'll, that'll help shift then the work that is happening in the world. So I just wanted to jump in and, and mention that. So. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I can't believe it, but we're almost at time. So I'm going to jump to the last question now, which, which is around the call of action, since we are in a room primarily of funders. Um, I hope by now that we are all aware in here of the need for trust-based philanthropy, um, you know, supporting your work with general operating grants, multi-year funding, a reduction in reporting requirements, all of those things um, I, I don't, I don't think you need to, to list for us. We know and shame on us if we're not doing it. Um, but, but tell us, what else can we do to support you all in the right way? And, and also, what are we doing wrong? What should, what should we sh shift? I, I can start with that. Um, in the spirit of changing narratives, I encourage folks to really challenge themselves when you go back to your offices, just like we've heard here. Look at your portfolios, yes, that's really great, but also look at the people that you're talking to, right? Bring young people to your tables, have advisory boards, really, don't just tokenize them, don't just get a report from your grantees and say, okay, have a listening session and then tell us what they said. Really sit down with them and have them in your room so that you can hear directly from them compensate them, give your grantees that money to provide the professional development to hire staff that can do that work because it is hard work. It's very intentional work. It takes a lot of authenticity to be able to sit with somebody, listen to them, and create that relationship. Relationship building is so important to create those leaders of the future, right? And the future is now, as we heard um, earlier this week. Um, but also think outside the box, right? Like giving a grant for operational um, monies is really great, but what about the convenings? We're hosting a convening that is completely planned by young people in Solidarity We Rise. We're, our, our focus <laughs> is to have over 60% of um, attendees be 25 and under, and it's oh. being planned by them. We're not just saying that, we're really walking the walk when we're uh, attempting to do that. And so why don't you, you know, think about sponsoring folks to go there? Why don't you think about hosting some convenings like that um, that completely knocks it out of the park? How can they find out more? They can go to our Instagram page or talk to any of us right here. <laughs> uh. Okay. You, yeah, 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 you get the last word. Um, I, I will say, you know, it's important for us, we, we call ourselves gender justice funders, right? And I think, you know, heavy on the justice. So, you know, one of my favorite definitions of justice is from Martin Luther King. Those of you who have heard me talk know that I quote this often, but his framework around justice is power correcting what stands against love. And if we call ourselves gender justice funders, then we are using our power to correct what stands against love. Mm -hmm. It means that we are leveraging our power to engage in the critical conversations that amplify and elevate love and the practice of it in the public sphere and the private sphere and those spheres that are hidden and unnamed. And so it is important, I think, for us as funders to really think about, number one, how we create partnerships that leverage power, that grow power, and that seed power when necessary. 
And so one of the things that we've been focused on at G4GC is this question of how you seed C-E-D-E seed and also S-E-E-D seed, right? And how we think about all the various ways that we can plant something beautiful by taking away those things that are toxic. Right? and creating space for there to be new growth, new opportunity. That has allowed us as a funder, as an intermediary, to partner with co-investors in specific ways, to partner with other intermediaries in powerful ways to reach communities that were previously way off the radar for folks. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we've been able to create new language, to sustain emergent language and frameworks, and to do it all in a very short amount of time. And so there are ongoing lessons that we have. There are robust ways that we're thinking about resourcing that extend beyond the philanthropic model. So I, you know, I welcome anyone who wants to learn more about our Future Economy Lab um, and all the er other ways that we're talking about investing. But it is also important, I think, for us when we're talking about what that call to action is, is to not forget about the intermediaries as a critical partner in the leveraging of power so we can be heavy on the Mm -hmm. Heavy on the justice. justice. <laughs> that's beautiful. Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> no, that's right. I think I think that's really beautiful. I would say the thing that I really love about G for GC and the way pivotal funds and works, the things that work is that they fund innovation. Let's try it. Like understanding so many places get to experiment and try, and that's how we learn. And we need that place to or space and resources to say, let's give that a chance. Oftentimes we have to come proving it worked. Well, if it worked and we knew that already, right, wouldn't everybody be doing it? So let's figure out in this different time, and I think especially now um, where a lot of young people um, have come of age in such a hard time during this global pandemic, right? And they've come of age in the workforce and many of us intergenerationally feel it. <laughs> They've come of age going from you know elementary to middle, middle to high school, um, and there needs to be some space and time to meet the new. One of my um, good, good friends, Monica Dennis S. What are folks inviting us into? What is this time inviting us into? And so, um, you know, I, I feel like Pivotal and G for GC hold that because. We can tell them, you know, we need time to plan. We need time to, that education piece is a part of the work. That reflection piece after this work happens or big campaign happens is a part of the work and that's okay. And also that piece around, you know, fellowships, funding um, young people to be able to try new things within the sector and to be a part of the conversation consistently, not have to wait to know when you know we're going to meet again to then get an honorarium, um, but to you know be okay to have some of that lull time, right, and and let it sit and then come back together because they have a fellowship and they're being paid. So just keep thinking outside the box. Whatever you do, keep funding, keep funding, and please, enough listening tours. I mean, I think whoever is going on the next listening tour, I, I'm not going to end that one, but I'm going to tell y'all, <laughs> there's so much that if you have, if you go online and listen, if you read the reports, there's so much that we're saying, um, and there's so much that is being done that's so innovative um, that that money could be well spent then funding that work. Amen. Pony, we're at, we're at time, so just last couple, last couple of thoughts on, on what funders can do better. Yeah, um, I would say that we should definitely like move to a framework of understanding like what, what like what serves young people, like what's in it for them. Um, and I think sometimes my generation gets critiqued because we do get told like, ah, oh, y'all always what's in it for y'all. If it's not in it for y'all, y'all out. But like realistically, that's how everybody else thinks. I think it's usually it becomes a negative thing when young people think it because there's this idea that young people are supposed, again, right, lack of autonomy. We're supposed to do things just cause. We're supposed to be accessible. We're supposed to be willing. We're not supposed to say, hey, I need to pay bills or hey, like I need to survive in this economy. We're just supposed to be grateful um, because we're giving you the chance. But like we're humans and we're trying to survive. So what is in it for us? And I ask that outside of just, you know, a financial scope, but outside of like 
like longevity. How do you keep young people, how do you retain them, right? Retention, like how do you get young people to still wanna be in these spaces, still doing this work, right? So like the money that you're putting out there doesn't just go in vain, isn't just like momentary, one, two years, and then that person moves on because they hated that environment. Like when you start to think like what is in it for them, it's it goes beyond just money, right? It goes again to support. And I think what all of you kind of touched on, like thinking outside of the box about where your money can go to, um, I grew up West African, so I grew up hearing engineer, doctor, lawyer, science. <laughs> and I'm even to this day, because I was studying for the LSAT for a while, and then I pivoted to get my comms master's. To this day, I have relatives that think I'm going to law school. <laughs> that I, I don't, mm -mm, I'm not even going to, I'm just like, yeah, law school's great, NYU law. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I say that to say that we know today that a lot of careers, there's opportunities to thrive and be brilliant in anything. So like, what is the fear with like funding something that's outside of the box? If you have young people that want to create murals, like art is so important to activism and advocacy. And so like, like fund them, fund those, those movements, fund, fund the folks who do want to do law, right? Like those are, ne that's necessary too. But I would just say be open and then think again, what's, what's in it for them? Like how can we continue to support them? You know, whether it's stipends to getting around a city if they're, you know, doing the work with you, whether it's, you know, fellowships, like that's bettering that their careers and like how are we giving them the tools to be leaders for tomorrow, to create leaders for after tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so that's what I would say. Thank you all. Thank you, Pony. Thank you all. Um, thank you all. And um, I just want to say, you know, Pivotal Ventures, we are so proud to have co-sponsored um, this, this beautiful conference. I see so many love people in the audience. Um, and, um, and check out Girls for Gender Equity. Check out Grant Makers for Girls of Color. Check out Justice Enjoy National Collaborative. All doing really amazing, amazing work. Thank you.